It's all the Foundations Radio. I'm your host, Steve Matley. We are coming to you today live from our studio. We are on KCAA 1050 AM, 102.3 FM and 106.5 FM. You can also catch us streaming on Roku, Fire TV, or Android on the Building Solid Foundations channel or on your favorite podcast platform. Today, my guest is Christine Shaw. Christine Shaw is a scientist, uh, works in the uh, biotech world. And I know her from a very different world, which is a real estate investing world. And so I had her on the show today to kind of talk through a little of her background and um, obviously her diverse interests. And I don't know much about the science side of what Christine does because we always talk real estate when we're together. So I'm going to learn a little bit about that today. Christine has spent nearly two decades in the biotech industry, leading product development of prenatal and infectious disease diagnosis for global companies such as Roche. In 2020, she led development of COVID-19 test, which doubled revenue growth and positioned her company for a $1.8 billion acquisition. Uh, she later got into real estate investing by becoming a private lender for fix and flip projects. And we have talked about that on the show in the past, what private lending is. So if you missed that, go back in the archives and look at the interview with Jack, Dr. Janice Bell, who also came out of the science business and went into private lending. Uh, Christine's gained experience in active and passive investing, owning rental properties and mortgage notes. And she's currently focused on co-managing a budget hotel investment portfolio and creating an impact investment fund for projects owned and operated by women entrepreneurs. So welcome, Christine. Thank you. Nice to be here. So the science background, working in biotech, um, that is definitely an industry above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> I remember taking chemistry class. Um, there was something about a table full of periods or something like that. Um, right. Yeah. Lots of letters on that table. Yeah. And there was a fume hood in the classroom. And that's about all I remember. <laughs> we got to play with fire sometimes. <laughs> So. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different sciences. Um, I, at an early age, um, you know, people often ask me, how long have I been doing this? Or when did I know I wanted to be a scientist? And ironically, or maybe not so ironically, when I was seven, I asked my parents for a microscope and a telescope for Christmas. So I kind okay. of say that I've always wanted to do that or been involved in it in some way. So that's just the full spectrum. You wanted to um, spy on the the, on the space and also spy on the cellular level. Yeah. Too, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> micro to macro. That's right. <laughs> Two extremes. All right. Uh, yeah. What's what's working in the cells and uh, what's working on the sun? Uh, so that was your. Uh, I remember my my dad had a telescope, a really nice one, and I I loved looking at it, looking through it, and looking at the stars. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a little microscope that my uh, we'd got as a gift, I think, from one of our uh, relatives. And I did like to putting various things. What I did learn is I think that's where I became a germaphobe. Um, I found out when you put anything under the microscope, there's always stuff in it. There's always stuff. Even yeah. stuff you don't <laughs> think should be there. And you realize nothing's ever clean. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that we do in the lab to create sort of awareness around um, cleanliness is is we have people take their hands and put it into a, a dish to culture and then they can see um, all of the different things that grow just from your hand in a, in a daily basis. So uh, that's always an eye opener. Yeah, and, and it, it doesn't matter. We think we wash and we think we sanitize and we think everything is good. Right. And then, um, yeah, so... I, I do know that um, the only people that don't worry about that are plumbers, because what I was what I was told is if you want to be a plumber, the one rule is don't bite your fingernails. So just it's <laughs> a good rule. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty aware of what's going on there. <laughs> the rest of us think our hands are clean, yeah, and you know we don't put that finger food in our mouths and don't think anything of it. But it's all around us, and it's even if we sanitize a lot, it's still there. It's just everything we yep. touch. Yep, yep, lots of microbes everywhere all and the time. And the water we drink and the, the food we eat, you know, you take a little bit of food and look inside there and there's, okay, I get there's a cell. What's the thing wiggling in there? That's not supposed to be in there, yeah. Yeah, one time my mom asked me, um, it, what do chromosomes look like? And I said, um, well, I tried to describe it in layman's terms. I was like, well, they're kind of like fat little sausages. <laughs> So nobody had ever asked me to really describe to them what a chromosome looked like under the microscope before. Uh, so. A little like maggots. Well, yeah, they yeah, don't yeah. move. Or they, they don't they move, but I'm saying, but they kind of look like that. Yeah, sort of tubular things. Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, I actually, um, I joked about, you know, science, but I did, I did enjoy, um, it was weird. I didn't, I wasn't good at science, but I enjoyed it. I found it fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, chemistry I didn't do so well, and physics I did pretty good in. 
and um, physiology, I, biology and physiology, I always did very well in it because mm-hmm. it was just interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I come out of a construction, mechanical building kind of a background. And to me, physiology was just the mechanics of the human body. That's right. what was fascinating. It's just all the parts and pieces that put together, yep. um, like a big erector set or a Legos or something like how, that. How to build a human kit. Exactly. <laughs> exactly what it is. And, you, of course, you learn it by coloring books, right? Yep, colored, a lot of colored pencils and that kind of stuff, and, and I find it I found it uh, very very interesting. Although it was certainly the thing I wanted to go into, um, most, again, one being a germaphobe, and two, um, the medical side of things. I don't like blood, so. Yeah, I I often, um, when I was in college, I thought about med school, but the thought of cutting into people or or poking them with needles um, wasn't something that really appealed to me. Yeah, yeah. There's the sympathetic pain part of it, and there's just the vile nature of everything in there doesn't look, it's, yeah. There's also a lot of liability. (laughs) A lot of liability, but to me, even even medical shows, when they want to be more graphic, I'm like, that's just gross. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to see that. I'm, I'm grateful people do it. I go to the dentist, I say, here's the mirror, I want to show you what we just did. I don't want to see it. Okay, I'm glad you stitched my mouth up, but I don't want to look at it, okay? <laughs> Just do it and let me go. <laughs> exactly. I'm, I'm, when it heals, I'll be great, but I don't want to spend a lot of time studying it. Uh, that's just not my, it's not, it's not my thing. Um, the only exception when I raised kids, um, that was the only time I could deal with that stuff because when you have kids, you deal with everything. Mm-hmm. The mucus, the vomit, all, the, all everything. Of the fluids. All, yeah, everything's coming out. And when it's your kid, it's okay. Any other, anybody else, I don't want to deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm glad you're doing that. I'm, I'm glad somebody's doing that. And you led the development of the COVID-19 test. Mm-hmm. And that was at a time when COVID was rampaging. Mm-hmm. Nobody understood it. We'd get all these news stories about all these people dying and we had to, we were going to refit auto factories into respirator factories and all this stuff. Remember all that stuff? Oh, yes. And the, the, the hospital ships, you know, the projections were just crazy. But nobody knew. Nobody was guessing. Yep. And there was there was no testing. There was not, not only was not a vaccine, there was no testing. Right. Yeah. It was a really interesting time. Um, you know, my my background is in genetics and we develop infectious disease testing um, at my company. And we were um, working on a different um, product at the time. And when COVID really started ramping up in the very beginning of 2020, um, I got a call from my boss. I was home visiting my family for the weekend and he called me and, and I had been watching the reports out of China and I knew what he was going to say. I'm like, we have to develop this test, don't we? And he's like, yeah, I think so. So as soon as I got back home um, Monday morning, we started looking. And what you do when you develop testing um, that's against a, a DNA sequence, you there's these large databases full of sequence in the world to any organism you can imagine. And if you want to direct a test to it, you go and you pull all these sequences out. It's kind of like a giant phone book um, for DNA and RNA sequences. And generally, if there's something that's been around a long time, there will be thousands and thousands and thousands of sequences available. You think about like bacteria or fungus or mice. That's a model organism that gets used a lot in, in science. Millions of sequences available in a giant database. We went to pull sequences for this new COVID virus. There were literally 40. Okay. So to try to make a test on that, it was a little bit of a wing and a prayer. And, um, you know, we, we, our test has held up and that's great. And you have to obtain uh, a virus to test with? Do you have to go get a well, COVID virus somewhere? And that's the really interesting part is like, how do you know if your test works? You need a, a sample um, to try to, to put into your test. But and you see also if don't want to bring COVID into your workplace. You don't. And people were very nervous about that. Yeah. They didn't even want the box coming to the loading yeah, dock if right. it had a positive sample. And now we have positive samples everywhere. But in the in the beginning, we actually did not have a positive sample. We had to synthetically create um, a positive sample by generating that sequence, um, you know, synthetically. Because there weren't any positive samples at that time. It was so early on in the pandemic. This is early on you know, February, March, 2020. Right. So, um, yeah, we were just really um, bootstrapping uh, to get that first test going. Okay. Yeah, that, that's interesting when you're on the, you know, the front edge of anything, you're doing a lot more guesswork than anything else early on. Yep, there's some informed guesses. Um, there's a lot of, you know, gosh, I really hope this works. You do the best you can and, and you let it go and you monitor really, really, really closely. Um, but there was so such demand for it that a lot of our customers were calling up and, and saying, is it ready yet? And we got it out pretty quickly, but they were still um, so eager to get the testing that they didn't even care if it had been QC tested yet. They just wanted oh, okay. it to be dropped off. And was, that, door. was that the antigen or the PCR? Or it's a PCR it? test. It's a PCR test. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. 
Yeah, and I remember that when it first came out, there were just lines at at the medical clinics that did the testing. Lines yep. of people that wanted to go get tested. There was no, there was no vaccine or no cure, but people just wanted to know if they had right, it. Right, right. Yeah. It was a it was a crazy time. I've never worked so much in my life. I remember, you know, my friends and family were quarantined at home and they were they were bored. Um, and I I thought, geez. I'm the opposite. I've never worked so much. I would. I remember coming into work at 6 a.m. and leaving at 11 p.m. and then going home, getting a few hours of sleep, and coming back and doing it all over again because we, we weren't mandated to do that, but it was so important. There was a global health crisis, and my team could, mm -hmm. and and wanted to address it as quickly as possible. And so we were we were there all day, every day for a few months just to make sure that we could get the test out because there was so much demand. Yeah, in that case, you've got a humanitarian motivation, but you also have a business motivation. It, right. it led to an acquisition worth right. almost two billion dollars. So there's there's both of those going concurrently, and that and you know, I don't have an issue with the business side of the medical world, honestly, uh, as long as it's not abused. But I, there has to be um, altruism is a great motivator, but honestly, um, tangible money is a big motivator too. And if right. that if that can be used to help people. <laughs> then that's not a bad thing. That's right. And, uh, you know, more than anything, you really saw the supply and demand side of economics happen yeah. um, during the pandemic because yeah. we could not produce nearly enough for what our customers right. wanted, um, and nor could any of the test makers. So, and then there were supply chain um, imbalances yeah. that we're still dealing with. Yeah. Um, so it was really interesting time to be working in the diagnostic space for, yeah. during the pandemic. We're going to take a short break. We're going to come back right after this. I'm talking to uh, Christine Shaw. She is a biotech scientist, and she is also a real estate investor. And we're going to get into a little more of what she does after this. This is Steve Matley on Building Solid Foundations. Fire Up Connect is the most innovative business networking group. Supporting and collaborating with a dozen of small businesses that are interested in building and establishing strong business connections. Hosting educational live seminars while carrying out business and community driven projects, as well as marketing programs as a part of its membership program. Fire Up Connect also offers virtual assistance with a wide range of services including, inbound customer support, chat support, appointment setting and email management, graphic designing video editing, web design and development, social media marketing, e-commerce solution, content writing and much more. For more information, head on over to www.fireupconnect.com. Fire Up Connect, helping success stories unfold every day. Estate. Men of Real Estate Radio Show here on KCAA. Oats mortgages can be purchased. All of us want to live in thriving communities. Basically, go to the radio station KCAA Radio.com. You can find us on your dial at 102.3 FM, 10:50 AM, as well as 106.5 FM. Hi, this is Steve Matley. As a construction professional, I know the importance of selecting the right contractor for the job. Power Solar employs only professional installers. Power Solar will provide a knowledgeable consultant to help analyze your current electric bill, identify site placement, and correct solar technology for your home. Contact KCAA producer at gmail.com for a free financial savings proposal with no obligation or call 951 551 1350 and ask for Ken. Again, that's KCAA producer at gmail.com or 951 551 1350 and ask for Ken. Welcome back to Building Solid Foundations Radio. I'm your host, Steve Matley. Today, we're talking to Christine Shaw. We've been, in the first segment, we talked about Christine's background working in biotech and some of her involvement in working on, on the first of the uh, COVID testing that came out. So she's a, a pioneer in that industry, which is, you know, I like having uh, celebrities in the... Uh, <laughs> the unknown celebrities, right, that are, that are in, the, in the studio with me. So Christine, I know Christine through the real estate world. So aside from doing the, the science side of the world, the biotech, uh, she also became a private lender. Now, um, most people that get into private lending, they kind of do it the other way. They get into doing some real estate investing, and then they learn about private lending. You started in the private lending side first, uh, which is unusual. 
Um, and and a little gutsy, actually, because for most people, they don't really understand that side of it too well. There's there's some steps you have to do. Yeah, you know. yeah. Um, for me, I started getting involved in real estate a few years ago because, um, you know, I wanted to pursue different income streams and I have a bit of an entrepreneurial side and I've always imagined myself running my own business at some point. So what I had was um, I was short on time because I do have a very demanding full-time job. Um, I did have some extra capital that I could deploy and I wanted to learn about real estate. So, so a lot of hours, but that also translates to pretty good pay. So you have some money you can deploy. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. That's right. So that formula sort of means that you could put yourself in the passive investor bucket um, and lend your money and make a return on it. So that's why I did start there. And it was gutsy. And looking back, I may not recommend that as a, as a path because you really learn um, some lessons that way. Um, I learned a lot of things doing it that way and I, some good, some bad. You learn a lot about vetting and due diligence. Right? Absolutely. It's not about do the numbers on the project make sense so much as can the person operating and managing that project actually make those numbers happen. That's right. Um, it's it's more about the project uh, manager. Yes, you're the investing operator. in the managers. That's exactly. Right. So a few close calls on that, um, but I came through in the end and then moved on to different types of projects from there. Okay. And and for people who don't know, private lending, uh, it's essentially when an individual acts like the bank. So if you have somebody that's doing a real estate investment and they need help acquiring the land or they need help getting rehab or construction funding, and instead of going to an institution, a smaller amount, you can loan them, say, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, you have that available, and you can loan that. Sometimes you can do it through a retirement account or something. Um, you can get pretty high interest, good return on it. They don't have to qualify through a bank, and you have a personal relationship. They have a personal relationship with the, where the money's coming from. Um, and as Christine said, you really need to know this person is um, experienced, and there's a high probability that they can do what they say they're going to do. Uh, you always have the risk of the market turning on you. That that can happen. But your bigger risk is a... Um, not necessarily incompetent, but a, uh, a manager who's over their head for some reason. Yeah, somebody who can't perform. Um, and I think that there are a lot of people in this industry who f fancy themselves as expert real estate investors um, or operators. And um, they're, they're not. They have this idea in their head that they're, they're quite good at it, but they're still learning like a lot of people and don't have quite enough experience to yet be taking people's money. Yeah, going to two weekends of seminars does not make you a real estate expert. Uh, watching HGTV will not make you a real estate expert. Please don't ever manage a project the way they do it on TV. Remember, they can't lose. They've got a national sponsor behind them. So they can do everything wrong and still come out sitting pretty. You can't. Um, so so you have to vet these uh, people and find out what have they done, um, how reliable are they, check personal references, mm -hmm. find out... It's a good idea to find out if they've, you know, lived in four different states in the last six months. That may be a big red flag. Those kind of things. Um, you know, find out who's working, and, and it's not just who they working with. Um, do they have Do they have a good business plan? Have mm -hmm. they, you know, so you do have to make sure the project's going to pencil, but you also make sure the person can make the project pencil, or so they don't tear something up and then figure out they're completely over their head, and. That's lost. right. That's right. I think a few things that I that I learned from my private lending was um, if somebody's not providing updates and I have to chase someone down to get them or they're not super responsive when I reach out, um, those are definitely red flags as well. Well, it probably means they don't want to give you bad news. That's right. Now, people reach out to for our, you know our projects, and in full disclosure, you've, you've invested in our in my projects as yep, well. Okay? I have, and um, they don't always go the way we want them to go, um, but. We try to update people. Much. It's not like every day we can't, but um, and we don't always have answers. Sometimes they ask a question and go, well, honestly, I don't have that answer at this point because somebody else has that answer who hasn't told me yet. Uh, when you're dealing with um, the public process, any any government agencies, you know, you, you don't know until they tell you. and But you still have to respond. You communicate as much as you can. And um, that, that's just the nature of it. So even if it's bad news, um, most of the investors almost all the investors we've ever dealt with, they've, they've been big boys and girls and understand what the real estate world is, that you don't control everything and not everything goes according to plan and they just want to know what's going on. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to give them bad news and they're going to show up with 
tar and pitchforks and those kind of things. You know, they'll just say, well, that sucks. Let's hope this gets better quick, right? Right. And, and, and you know, and, and they understand because the money they've invested, uh, and I will tell you, anybody out there, because this isn't really a show on investing today, but if we are talking about that, if you want to get into that game, never invest money that you don't, you can't afford to lose. This is money for investing. This is not your mortgage money. This is not your rent money, your grocery money. This is not your uh, kid's college fund. This is not, you know, any of those kind of things. <laughs> it's it's not your retirement unless it's a direct, self-directed retirement that's designed to be invested in this. It's not borrowing from your company 401k at interest. Uh, these are not ways you do this. So, so make sure that you do only use money that is for investing and will, will not change your lifestyle if it goes bad. And also make sure that you fully vet. I'm, I'm, I'm aware every time an investor comes in that they are cyber stalking me. Um, they're probably doing uh, skip tracing on me. Um, I get it. I understand that. They're researching myself and my partners and they want to know what we're doing. And um, that's what we sign up for because I need to know that the investors are comfortable as much as they need to know that they can trust us. It's amazing what you can find on Google. Yeah. On Go well, just starting with Google, but then if you end up with things like skip tracing software mm -hmm. and those kind of things, you can find a lot more out. Uh, I know that one of the uh, people that both of us have worked with, she was doing a little seminar on vetting and she just happened to use me as her guinea pig. I don't know why. Uh, she didn't ask me about it, and she went and brought me up on the skip tracing on the big screen, and she discovered I had a, I had a par traffic ticket. So, you know, from <laughs> about a traffic ticket from, I want to say, about 12 years ago. And she said, see, look, he's a criminal. You know? <laughs> but then, other than that, it was pretty clean, you know. And that's the thing, you know, when, when you get in this business, if you want to take people's money, uh, have a clean background. If you don't, you probably shouldn't be taking people's money. That's pretty important. Yeah, so if, you, if you'd be embarrassed if people found things out about you, um, self-fund or find a different line of work. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. And, and, um, vetting is, is huge. And, and as Christine learned, um, through a few bumps, if you don't vet thoroughly, sometimes something will fall through the cracks. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's right. And that's, that's what sort of pivoted me toward other types of projects. Um, you know, I, I have invested in a couple of Steve's projects, um, as he mentioned, as, as well as, um, other types of syndications, which, you know, same same thing. You really have to vet who's operating those those projects um, that are the larger, you know, apartment buildings or development projects. Um, and you know, they're they're recruiting people to to join in and invest. And here's the numbers. And okay, well, that's great. But have you done this before? And right. have you delivered on your promises? Um, have you? Do you have any SEC violations? <laughs> That's right. Uh, tax liens and those kind of things. Yeah, find out all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, jail time, whatever. So you want to you want to check all those things. Um, you know, there's uh, nobody's probably perfectly clean. I, mean, I got a traffic ticket back there, but you know, most nobody's perfectly clean because we're all human. But at the same time, you want to look for things that are red flags. Um, I, I I do know that um, it, we feel the same way about our investors, and I don't really so much cyber stock investors, but I want to meet them and talk to them and know who they are. I don't want just a check from somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody because I need to know that they're fit for the right investment. Um, like the projects we do aren't for everybody. They're longer term, they're speculative real estate investing, they're entitlement, you know, which has some risk in it. Everything has risk in it. And um, I want to know that they're not the kind of people that are going to put money in and then never sleep until the money comes back because that's not, that's not fair to them. You, if, if that's the way they are, they need to invest in something a lot more secure like, uh, you know, T-bills, CDs, mutual funds, uh, something a lot a lot easier. Those are the investors that are going to be contacting you every day wanting an update because they're nervous. <laughs> that's right. And, and that just means that that's not good because now we've taken their peace of mind. And I don't, we could give them uh, an outlandish return monetarily, but if that ruined their life, for 18 months in between, mm -hmm. that's, that's it's not a not good worth payoff. It for them. It's not, that's not a good payoff. Nope. And, and not everybody is cut out to do the same thing. So that's important if you're out there thinking about, you know, different, what can you do? Know your temperament. Are you risk averse? Are you mm -hmm. risk tolerant? Uh, do you have money you can afford to lose if everything goes bad? Um, you know, there's rumors about what's going on in the market now. I hear all kinds of conflicting stories, but every day, no matter whether the market's up, down, or in between, you have an opportunity to lose money in the real estate market mm -hmm. or in the stock market or in the precious metals market or in the commodities market. I don't care what you're playing. In, in cybersecurity uh, it, coins, right? 
everything goes up and down. And investing is that. It's not a gamble because it's, it's researched and there's something behind it, but there is, there is a risk to it. Everything has risk to it. And if it doesn't have risk, there'll be no return. That's why when you invest in a CD at the bank, you don't get any interest because there's no risk. You're guaranteed by the government to get your money back. Yep. That's right. And You're just therefore... guaranteed to have it erode to inflation as well. That's right. That's right. You're guaranteed <laughs> you're losing the value, but you're not going to lose it. You're guaranteed that it's not, the principal's not going anywhere, um, which is why there's no return on it. So just know that that's the rule out there. Uh, when we come back, let's talk about, um, I know you've got some things going on in the um, rental and multifamily space, and you've got a partner you're working with there. So we'll get into that realm of Christine Shaw's life. Uh, when we get out back from this break. This is Building Solid Foundations. I'm your host, Steve Matley, and we are talking today in the studio with Christine Shaw, who is a scientist and a real estate investor. Fire Up Connect is the most innovative business networking group, supporting and collaborating with a dozen of small businesses that are interested in building and establishing strong business connections hosting educational live seminars while carrying out business and community-driven projects, as well as marketing programs as a part of its membership program. FireUp Connect also offers virtual assistance with a wide range of services including inbound customer support, chat support, appointment setting and email management, graphic designing video editing, web design and development, social media marketing, e-commerce solution, content writing and much more. For more information, head on over to www.fireupconnect.com. Fire Up Connect, helping success stories unfold every day. Real Men of Real Estate. Real Men of Real Estate radio show here on KCAA. Oats mortgages can be purchased. All of us want to live in thriving communities. Basically go to the radio station KCAARadio.com. You can find us on your dial at 102.3 FM, 1050 AM, as well as 106.5 FM. Hi, this is Steve Matley. As a construction professional, I know the importance of selecting the right contractor for the job. Power Solar employs only professional installers. Power Solar will provide a knowledgeable consultant to help analyze your current electric bill, identify site placement, and correct solar technology for your home. Contact KCAA producer at gmail.com for a free financial savings proposal with no obligation or call 951 551 1350 and ask for Ken. Again, that's KCAA producer at gmail.com or 951 551 1350 and ask for Ken. Welcome back to Building Solid Foundations Radio. This is your host, Steve Matley. We are in the studio today with Christine Shaw. Christine is two decades in the biotech industry, uh, leading uh, development of um, diagnosis of infectious diseases and prenatal diseases. She also headed up the development of COVID-19 testing way back in 2000, early 2020 when nobody had those. And we've been talking about her journey from there into the real estate world, doing private lending first and then moving into other investments. So I, she's very active right now in rental properties. And I know she's working with a, um, a partner, a group doing multifamily or mm -hmm. hotels, right? Hotels and multifamily. That's right. Yeah. yeah we have, um, so my business partner and I have acquired a couple of, uh, I guess three now, um, budget hotels in the Phoenix area. And the reason that we've focused on that segment is because during um, COVID-19, those, that hotel segment actually did very, very well. So these are the... Um, the suites with the kitchenettes in them so that you can actually live there. So these extended are the extended stay. stay type things. That's right. They're somewhere between an apartment and a hotel. Yeah, that's right. And so when all of the crackdowns were happening on hotels where either people weren't vacationing, so they weren't staying in hotels, or there was some restriction put on how many people could stay, none of that applied to the budget um, extended stay segment because these are actually sometimes people's homes. They're, they're temporary residences for people, yes. That's right. Um, so they actually did really well during COVID. Um, the Phoenix area was 
poised very well for growth, a lot of blue collar workers. So um, the market is really, really good to support, um, you know, the fundamentals of the growth of these properties going forward. And um, as you do, or, or as you can do with a lot of multifamily properties, you buy something that's not being operated terribly well, at a discount, you get it functioning well, and then you're poised to, um, you know, refinance or sell at a premium later after you get it um, operating. So it's like nicely. the value add apartment building kind of complex. Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. So um, that's what we're, we're working on now. We're getting everything stabilized, uh, bringing in a lot of processes and procedures that um, had kind of been lacking when those properties were acquired uh, last year and getting them to profitability and then um, scaling that business to potentially add more to the portfolio. Okay. And, and Phoenix is a good market. It's been the fastest growing city in the country for several years. I want to say five, six years ago, it was kind of ranked kind of around where San Diego is. And then it passed up uh, what San Antonio last year and another city it passed up. Anyways, it's, it's like right behind Houston now. Yeah, it's number five. Um, Houston's number four. So, uh, it, it seems really well poised, especially it's a, it's a sun state. A lot of, uh, people moving there from the Northern states, um, taxes are are favorable versus other states. Uh, so a lot of reasons why Phoenix is an attractive market. It also did not have as severe the COVID restrictions that other states did. It was, it was fairly wide open and those states tended to get a lot of people that came in Mm -hmm. from other states. Yep. They so. did. So um, there's there's a lot of potential there still to add more to the portfolio, but we're also looking at other markets that might um, also be good for this uh, budget hotel extended, extended stay model. Now, um, on a side note, how many of the people coming from places like California do you think moved to Phoenix that'll spend two summers there and decide they may have going to rethink what they did? <laughs> uh, I don't I don't want to go there during the summer. <laughs> I'll go in the winter, no problem. But yeah. I mean, you know, not being a native Californian, I know that they, they tend to like their uh, California, Southern California California's in particular. Very spoiled. Temperatures. Very yeah. soft when it comes to weather. Yes, They, they are. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're on the coastal part of California. So, you know, if you're coastal, San Diego, Orange, LA, Ventura County, uh, 80 degrees is too hot to live, and 60 degrees is like a Patagonian expedition. It's freezing. That's yeah. right. I always say if it's not in the 70s, it's too hot or too cold to That's Southern right. Californians. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I was I was in Texas looking at property a few weeks back, and I was sitting in a meeting with these people, and they were asking me. They said, "Okay," because I was telling them some of the issues we had with some of our California projects. They said, "Well, why don't you just move?" And I said. Um, well, let's see. This is a great place. It's beautiful. It's easy to work here, but it's 102 degrees outside and 87% humidity. I, I don't deal with that where I come from. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's really hard to give up. I I don't. We'll we'll see if there's an influx back into California at some point. Yeah, I I don't know, and and it depends on what reason. If they left strictly for affordability reasons, that could happen. If the market turns or whatever, which I don't see happening severely, but mm-hmm. it could. Um, if they left for political reasons, that's not going to change. That's going to get more so. Yep. So that that's a, depends on what your philosophy is and why you decided to leave California. I know people have done both for both reasons. Um, I do know that uh, if you move to places like that, it's okay to come back to visit. Right. That, that's the plan, right? So yep. if you move to a cold state, then you stay in the cold state during the summer and you come back to California in the winter. Snowbird. If you move to Arizona, a hot state, then you live there in the winter and you come back to Southern California in the summer. Right? Yeah. As long as you're that partial year resident, you can uh, try to get out of the taxes. That's right. That's the goal. <laughs> and that and that's the thing. I say when I say political, I mean things like the the tax yep. rates and the you know some of the employment restrictions and those kind of things we have here. Right. And it's just it's the price of paradise, I guess. So you know, I still live here. People all this time ask me why do you stay in California, and I tell them. Well, as a business owner, first of all, my business is not in California. It's in Florida. Mm-hmm. That's where my partner lives. Um, and all the different projects are wherever they're located in Texas, Florida, Arizona, wherever. Um, so there's that. I still have to pay my income taxes here in California. That's that's true. Um, I have to deal with the uh, more uh, aggressive lockdowns. They're talking, LA's talking about locking down again because of COVID popping up again. It's just the nature of the state the way they deal with, that's fine. Um, but the things that they lock you down from are cool things to go to, right? The other states don't have those things, so there's that. But I tell people my relationship with California is like being with, in a relationship with a um, high-maintenance, spoiled, rotten, completely abusive woman who is so beautiful you cannot leave. Because <laughs> I live in San Diego. 
I live with a view of the bay right outside Balboa Park. It's 70 degrees every day with a cool breeze. And it, there's a lot I will put up with before I will move. Yeah, well, that is a very high-maintenance woman. <laughs> that is very, yes, yes. There's a lot I will put up with um, because, you know, it's just so nice. Yep. Yeah, yep. I, I, every, I, every time I go out of state and I look, I think, gosh, look, I got a house for this price. And, and I do projects. It's so easy to get these things done. There's no red tape. But I come back home like, oh, it's so nice here. Yeah, I agree. When I, I used to live in Texas, um, and I sort of forgot for a little bit about the hot, humid weather. And then in April, I was back in Austin for a little bit, and it was a little a little hot while I was there. And I was like, okay, now I remember. And now I April. remember what it's that's like. Not, that's not August. I know, I know. So. Yeah, I was in San Antonio <laughs> and Austin last July, and it was pretty pretty brutal. And, and, of course, Houston takes the cake for the worst weather in the country, I yes. think. Yep, I spent not, eight years there. Not winter weather, but the worst just overall weather. It's, oh, sticky and hot. It's and brutal. It's brutal. And then you got... And then you you have sticky, hot, humid season, and then you have hurricane season. That's right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, you know, and but I like visiting those places. I, I like I love Florida. Everything's beautiful down there. It's green. Uh, people are nice down there. A lot of great things to do. But it is hot, humid, and the mosquitoes you could put a saddle on. So. Yes. Yeah. The mosquitoes are like pterodactyls. You know. Yeah. It's they, like they, they, they didn't you die and off take you away and then eat you later. Yeah. Save, right. you, save you for tomorrow's <laughs> meal. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Um, my, my daughter, one of my daughters lives in the Northeast. I love visiting there. I like Boston. Mm-hmm. I like Connecticut. Uh, weather's not so great. And they have uh, other types of vermin. Uh, ticks everywhere. It's weird. Yeah. Ticks are no joke. You want to yeah. make sure you, you find those right away. <laughs> yeah. And then I've got another daughter in the Northwest. Northwest I like a lot, but it does rain a lot. Mm-hmm. And I'm an outdoor person. And I know up there they say, we're outdoors all the time. What are you talking about? You can understand when you're raised in Southern California, you act like you're made of paper mache. If you want to step out in the rain, we might melt, so, so, right? We just lock ourselves up. There's always, I, I laugh because, um, you know, on a work day where there's just a slight amount of rain, a little bit of drizzle, everybody stays inside and orders lunch. And That's right. And it's great because there's so much parking available That's if right. I go out to lunch. Those are the days I do leave the building to oh, yeah. go. Oh, everything shuts down. It's, it's, it's like it would be a snow day in the Northeast or right. something. Right. <laughs> For us. Oh, look, if it's wet. No, no, not wet. So... Yeah, it's 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 a weird phenomenon here, but I like it. If, if you know, if that's my complaints, though, I'm okay with it. So you um you you have a partner with this. You're doing uh, more of these, mm-hmm. and you're looking at expanding to other states. Is that right? Potentially, yeah. We're looking at other markets that would um be somewhat similar to Phoenix, where there's a lot of a need for um blue collar type housing, budget hotel, extended stay, uh, an influx of worker population and, um, you know, friendly business practices, all, so of, all of the things you usually look Similar for. profiles to Arizona, so Texas, Tennessee, Carolinas, Florida, those yep. kind of places. Yeah, right? exactly. We're looking at potentially like a San Antonio type market or, um, yeah, exactly. San Antonio is a great workforce market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we did projects out there. Austin didn't, didn't really fit because we, you know, we're focused on the entry level R1 type lot. And in Austin, everybody's a transplant from Silicon Valley. They want to live in a loft downtown. Right. So it's a different world. Uh, San Antonio's workforce. And, and it's uh, not necessarily blue collar. Uh, it, there's some of that, but it's just workforce. Mm-hmm. Uh, Middle class America type housing. And that, that fits. Uh, Phoenix was like, is like that for us. Uh, yep. It works out very well. Central Florida works out that way for us. Um, Tennessee would if we could ever get any land there, but it's so competitive out there. It's ridiculous. It's, it's hard to find anything out there. Um, so are your plans to go beyond doing just those type of investments? Are you looking at moving to uh, other types? Well, you know, thinking sort of longer term and with um, philanthropy in mind, um, we, my partner and I would really like to focus on, you know, we, we, we really like to celebrate women entrepreneurs, and we want to really be able to provide backing, um, funding, raising capital for women entrepreneurs to be successful. So talking about finding those great operators, the people you can trust to really execute on projects, um, and women-owned and operated businesses, we would love to uh, raise capital for those for those businesses and those projects um, that we can trust to put money behind and bring on investors for those projects and also fund philanthropic uh, ventures to either boost local economies or provide um, charity funding to a variety of different charities. So we're really looking at um, how we can sort of 
put all of those those desires and, and needs and, and um, you know things that we would like to do all together in a in a way to fund projects and bring investors that have capital to projects that really are deserving of it. Great. We're gonna, we're gonna, let's talk about that when we get back from the break. We're going to take another short break here, and we'll, we'll kind of unpack that whole thing and see what that looks like. Uh, this is uh, Steve Matley on Building Solid Foundations Radio. I'm talking to Christine Shaw. We'll be right back after this. Fire Up Connect is the most innovative business networking group. Supporting and collaborating with a dozen of small businesses that are interested in building and establishing strong business connections. Hosting educational live seminars while carrying out business and community driven projects, as well as marketing programs as a part of its membership program. Fire Up Connect also offers virtual assistance with a wide range of services, including inbound customer support, chat support, appointment setting and email management, graphic designing, video editing, web design and development, social media marketing, e commerce solution, content writing, and much more. For more information, Head on over to www.fireupconnect.com. Fire Up Connect, helping success stories unfold every day. Real Men of Real Estate. Real Men of Real Estate radio show here on KCAA. Oats mortgages can be purchased. All of us want to live in thriving communities. Basically, go to the radio station KCAARadio.com. You can find us on your dial at 102.3 FM, 10.50 AM, as well as 106.5 FM. Hi, this is Steve Matley. As a construction professional, I know the importance of selecting the right contractor for the job. Power Solar employs only professional installers. Power Solar will provide a knowledgeable consultant to help analyze your current electric bill, identify site placement, and correct solar technology for your home. Contact KCAA producer at gmail.com for a free financial savings proposal with no obligation or call 951-551-1350 and ask for Ken. Again, that's KCAA producer at gmail.com or 951-551-1350. 1350 and ask for Ken. Welcome back to Building Solid Foundations Radio. I'm your host, Steve Matley. I'm in the studio today with Christine Shaw. Christine Shaw is a scientist in the biotech world, and she is also an investor and um, project manager in the real estate world, uh, working currently in uh, multifamily and hotel investments out of state. Um, Christine, when we, before the break, you mentioned that your next endeavor is working on funding projects for women business enterprises and um, doing charitable work. So kind of walk us through that, um, what that looks like and how you see that laying out. Yeah, so um, I, I've met a lot of great women um, throughout my real estate, um, you know, adventure over the last few years. And being partnered up with um, other women entrepreneurs, we really would like to support others who are getting started or who just are scaling their business and have a need for capital. At the same time, there are a lot of people we know that have capital and really are looking for trustworthy projects um, that have a, a good return. So being an intermediary of the two um, seems like a great fit uh, to bring people together and also be able to provide some philanthropic funding for projects that we care about, such as um, supporting women's causes, things like local economies or just supporting arts or, you know, pet rescues close to my heart, Any anything that really has an impact. So impact investing has really um, become a lot more popular in, in recent years. And, uh, you know, we'd like to support that and be able to make matches between people with capital, people who need capital, and then um, do some good along the way. So that's really what um, I'm focusing on now with my partner is sketching out what does that look like? Um, who can we bring on board that we feel um, meets the criteria of being a good operator, having a good, you know, P&L um, and being able to manage projects and, and have some cushion for if things get bumpy in the market and then getting some uh, people with capital on board. Okay. And, and so having a business enterprise that has some type of a higher purpose always to me is a, is a, it's a win-win for everybody. And, and to me, 
running a business to generate money is fine, but you have to ask why are you generating the money? There's a there's got to be a reason. Money itself is just a tool. It's just a thing. Um, money is to be traded for something else. Is to be used for something else. Is to be invested in other things. So if you can do an enterprise that generates money, then that money can then go do other things. Then there's more, I guess, not just justification, but but uh, more motivation right. to do that because because you know that every dollar you make in in the real estate enterprise is helping over here, whether it's pet rescue or um, helping, uh, you know, scholarship funds, whatever it is. Right, right. Yeah, and when I think about it, you know, there's a number that's enough, right? You you, you can live a comfortable lifestyle, you can go on the vacations that you want, um, and, and you don't need gobs and gobs more money after that. So for me, it's really about just being comfortable, having the freedoms that I want in life. But beyond that, when I think about just my day job too, um, the things that really are rewarding for me are, are helping other people grow their careers and becoming um, independent and um, leveling up, you know, and seeing them really succeed. And so I want to be able to do that in the real estate space as well and, and also be able to accommodate, um, you know, a little bit more time freedom in my own life um, and not work myself to death. That's always a good thing, too. Um, we usually start um, our careers and the only way to do it is to trade our time for money. And if we can manage that successfully over a period of time, you can reverse that and now use your money to buy back your time. And that, that, that's why I'm self-employed myself. I, I made that decision. My, I still, my kids were not grown up yet. Um, and I made that decision to do that. That's when I first started my business 20 years ago. And it was nice because then I, I left the check-in, check-out job I loved that. Actually, I loved that job. It was great. I would have stayed there forever otherwise. But um, I left that, but I was home. So I could go volunteer at my kid's school. Mm-hmm. I'd see them. It kind of was kind of nice to have that freedom available. I worked out of the house. So I was there when they left. I was there when they came back. My commute was two flights of stairs instead of down the freeway. <laughs> it was kind of nice, you know. Um, and now, of course, my kids are grown now. But one of the things you mentioned was helping other people kind of make that transition. Uh, One of the things that my partners and I have always been very proud of is the the chain of investors that we've had over a few decades that started with just what they could eke together to put into an investment. They'd had a, you know, $10,000 in an IRA or something like that. That's all they had. And they just wanted to start somewhere. And then as they go through different iterations and not just our projects. Sometimes that they take money out of that and put it in other things too. But being a part of helping them to where now they are doing very well. They've got real estate portfolios of their own. They're, you know, past the accredited investor milestone way back when. Um, and to know that we're a piece of that, you know, we're not responsible for it, but we were a, we were a small part of that. We helped get that going. Uh, to me, that's that's very gratifying because I know that their families' lives are better. They're more secure. Um, they're not killing themselves in business. You know, there was a couple that was older. They it enabled them to sell their business finally. And they were working very hard at it in order to sell it, and and not so much retire, but then just shift into more real estate acquisition and stuff. And they were poised uh, to have a, a proceeds that came out when the downturn hit, so they could go buy things up at low prices. And they they did well. So um. We're going to have to wrap this up. We're, we're almost at the end. I just wanted to get some, any final thoughts you have for people out there that are like you doing your job and thinking, uh, is there something else I can do more to life? Yeah. I mean, just really take stock of what, you know, what lights you up? What passions do you have? I mean, it sounds cliche, but, um, you know, there's there's lots of stuff you like to do and that you can turn into um, a side gig, really. Um And I think that for me, what I've learned through real estate and what has helped me really meet very genuine, trustworthy, great people that I want to work with, you just have to get out and network, you know, meet people. Um, You'll be able to tell soon enough the good from the bad. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just so important because you meet some really great people and you never know where it's going to lead, Um, whether it's to a deal or to, you know, new job offers or new friendships. um, It's it's really just about getting out and hearing what people are up to and and pressing the flesh. And it takes time, Um, you know, but I always go back to, you know, don't overestimate what you can do in a year and don't underestimate what you can do in 10 years. Right. So start today and. If you're in it for the long haul, you'll be shocked at where you get in five to 10 years from now. 
Uh, you're crazy if you stay consistent with it and get out there and talk to people. And the, you're right, right, the connections are one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle. Uh, with that, we're going to have to uh, say adieu for today. Uh, this has been Christine Shaw joining me today on Building Solid Foundations Radio. Um, we will be back uh, next week. You can catch us live every week on Thursdays and on Sundays at 3 p.m. Catch us on Roku, Fire TV, or Android on the Building Solid Foundations channel or on your favorite podcast platform. Uh, I'm your host, Steve Matley, and we will see you next week. Until then, go do something different this week. 